our home where is your hand in this how will we cope where is your plan in this spirits alone fires they rage in this world that you own but nothing is out of your reach may we never forget that you are the God over everything Even the darkest of days should despair For you are the God over everything Storms at your feet sing thunderous praise And with death on a leash There's power in every word that you speak Commander and conqueror, comfort in grief A love that I know will never be So easy to forget For you are the God over everything Even the darkest of days should despair For you are the God over everything time in your plan for you are the God over everything show me how much I need you just to stand for you are the God over everything One hand that this world needs to cope Pierced and forsaken for my wretched soul The purest was taken but death cannot hold Could death be so bold and bereft? May we never forget That you are the God over everything of day should despair for you are the God over everything may we never forget that you are the God over everything even the darkest of day should despair for you are the God over everything my name before time in your plan you are the god over everything show me how much i need you just to stand for you are the god over everything And good morning. Welcome to our online service here at Lempster Baptist Church. I thought I'd choose a different location um, to shoot the video in this week just to give you a change of perspective. Eventually I'll get round every room in the church in the manse um, <laughs> if this keeps going. Um, it's good to have you here with us again. Uh, if you're new and you're just joining us for the first time then it's great to have you here with us. Please feel free to get in touch, ask questions if you want to find out more. Uh, I just have a couple of updates and things to tell you about. Uh, the first is regarding the online service. Uh, you may be watching this on YouTube and, and that's great. Uh, you might be watching it on the church website, on the online page and that's okay. But there is now a new option for you, um, an interactive service. Uh, what that means is that the service will be going out um, almost 
it's called simulated live that it, you won't be able to pause and rewind it so it'll be going out at 10 30 uh, but along with that there is a, a facility that you can chat to each other and talk to each other for half an hour before the service and half an hour after it ends uh, and so if you go on the church web page uh, and on the online service bit it will say click here for interactive service uh, and you can click on that and then you give yourself a nickname um, hopefully something that we can identify you by um, boss hog or something like that I don't know who has that name um, and you, you sign in and then you can chat to each other you can talk to each other um, you can have discussions you can just catch up and it just adds another element to our services together um, if you are watching it a bit later you can still sign in and the video might be out of sync um, but you can still chat along with other people and and catch up and so I'd encourage you to give that a look and try that out this morning. Uh, this week on Wednesday we are planning to have a, a series of prayer meetings on Zoom, um, this new thing that God has sent down from on high that we can communicate with each other and silence people when we don't want to hear them. Uh, and so that's going to be going on a Wednesday. Um, we're asking people to sign up and we're going to have four sessions, one at 10 o'clock, one at 12 o'clock, one at 4 o'clock and one at 8 o'clock in the evening. Um, led by different people and we're asking for people to sign up to one of those and um, just send us an email and say which one you'd like to go on so we can communicate to you when you're going to be on um, who you're going to meet with the reason being is that if you have so many people um, the time limit on there means that we wouldn't be able to pray effectively we feel and so we wanted to, to cut it down into smaller groups so we're still praying on that day um, but in, in smaller chunks and so please have a think about that and if you want to be a part of that it's 10 o'clock 12 o'clock 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock let us know which one you want to be a part of and we'll send you the details of that meeting uh, this evening at 6 30 there'll be another video uploaded uh, where we take communion together so if you'd like to get some bread and some wine ready we'll do that at 6 30 uh, and that'll be put online at that time um, also, I just need some help. Um, last week, we said we put a board out front, a big rainbow saying thank you, and asked people to, to write in with people they're thankful for and grateful for. And we've had quite a number from people in the church and also quite a number from people in the community. The only problem was we didn't think about the rain. Um, well, we did a bit, but we thought it'd be okay. But um, as it started raining, the, the paint started peeling. Uh, and so what I'm appealing for is any DIY expert, any handyman who has any advice on how we might waterproof this. Uh, I was thinking just some varnish that we could paint on, uh, but we don't have any varnish. Uh, so if you've got some and we're able to borrow it or, or just use it, uh, that would be great. Um, uh, or if you have any other suggestions that are more effective and would make a better job uh, so we can keep the board out there um, as a, a way of communicating and standing with the community at this time, then please let us know um, so we can get that out there again. Um, and lastly, uh, just some wonderful news to share with you. Uh, we've been told that David and Naomi Margetts uh, are expecting a baby. Uh, and so that's wonderful. Congratulations to you both. Uh, we hope you're both keeping well and our prayers uh, are with you at this time. Uh, Naomi did say she had thought about not telling anyone and seeing how long lockdown lasted and then going into lockdown without a baby and coming out with a baby, <laughs> which would have been fantastic. Uh, but they've decided to share the news. And so that's great. Uh, and we're very thankful for them for, for lifting us up with that news at this time. In a moment we're going to, to just pause and worship together uh, before we think about something as I think we do we are going to round off this series on the way of peace uh, and what that means uh, and it's it's probably the most important message today it's probably the most significant um, we're not going to go long today we're just going to keep it simple um, but I think it's it's what we need um, perhaps more than anything else and it's a culmination of a lot of thoughts and discussions with people over the last few weeks uh, so I'm just going to pray um, and then we'll worship together. Father, I thank you again for an opportunity to, to fix our minds on you. Uh, we recognise that this isn't church. Watching something and, and, and just seeing something isn't church. Church is the community, it's the fellowship. And so I thank you that outside of this, this way of keeping in touch, there is more going on. Your church is loving one another. Your church is representing your goodness and your glory and your grace in these times that we are standing and shining a light and I pray that we would continue to do that and I ask today Father for your Holy Spirit I feel particularly today uh, a weakness in what I'm about to present uh, a weakness in what I'm about to share in that it, it depends on you Father it's reliant on your power and your grace to, to fill it and and to give it meaning and to lead us in it and so I pray for myself Father help me not to complicate this not to over complicate it and to add my thoughts and, and things to it let me present what you want to say and may we discover you through this we ask it in Jesus name Amen
as I mentioned, the, this this thing that I'm going to share today is it's a culmination of thoughts and ideas and discussions with different people. And I've just asked Marie just to share a few of the thoughts that she shared with me. Um, they just to kind of give it an outline of where we're going and an idea of, of what I've been thinking. Um, and then we're going to look at a passage together. So I'll just hand over to Marie for a second. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dean's just asked me to share a few words with you this morning, um, things that I've been thinking through and reading over the last couple of weeks. And this time reminds me a little bit of when I was in hospital for so long. And during that time, the words of the song from Matt Redman used to come into my mind quite a lot. And it says, when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come. And it kind of feels a bit like that now because we feel like all has been stripped away. And I was challenging myself really, then is that a time when I can just simply come? Because we live in a, a really busy world and we're always moving on to the next thing. We're always making plans of where we're going to go, what we're going to do, who we're going to see. And, and I, for one, like a plan. So I can understand why a lot of people feel as though they've almost lost a bit of control at the moment, because we don't know. We're in very uncertain times right now, and we, we don't know a plan out of this yet. But I was thinking the world is a much quieter place right now. And maybe that's a time when we can simply come. And technology is great and I'm appreciating it more now than ever because I can catch up with friends and family and the church service on a Sunday and it's great. But I had a little note came up on my phone the other day and it showed me how many hours I'd spent screen time. And I thought that was quite, it quite staggered me. I couldn't quite believe I'd spent all that much time on my phone. And I was thinking very often when we respond to things or make decisions if we do it from a busy place and a crowded mind then maybe it's not always the best response or the right decisions that we're making and I then read that when we have that intimacy with God then very often our responses shift from being a head response to being a heart response and I also read that there are bits of us that can only really be fed in the quiet times. And that led me on to think about our innermost being. And it's not really a word that we use much now, innermost, but it really means our thoughts and what's going on inside of us. And the innermost word is mentioned many times in the Bible. Uh, in the Amplified Version, in John chapter 7, verse 38, Jesus says, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow streams of living water. And from the NIV, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, He may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. And from Psalm 139, verse 13, for you created my inmost being, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. And I know very often being alone with our thoughts can sometimes be quite uncomfortable. And sometimes when we have this quiet time, our mind tends to wander. And very often those thoughts that then come into our minds are, are not helpful and they're not uplifting at all. But I I really believe at the moment that God is longing to reach our innermost being. And the, the song I referred to, um, the Matt Redman one, it goes on to say, you look much deeper within, you're looking into my heart. And I also read this week that if you look through the Bible, there's a whole host of people that when they faced up to the glory of God, they often found themselves facing downward in worship. And I've been looking at all of the times when Jesus withdrew from people, from ministry, from crowds, from life. And I know we didn't choose this situation, but on many, many accounts in the Bible, Jesus actually chose to take himself away. So I thought I'd look into some, just a few of those really. Um, and in Luke chapter four, 
Jesus spent 40 days praying in the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan. And after those 40 days, he then began his public ministry. He then took himself away, Mark chapter 6 tells us, 30 to 32. He encouraged others to take time away as he encouraged the disciples to take time to rest. And then in Luke 6, 12 to 13, Jesus spent the whole night praying alone with his father before a major decision. And that major decision the next day was when he chose the 12 disciples. And again in Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it says Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. And every day um, we FaceTime. I FaceTime the grandchildren and they're busy households. There's a lot of noise going on. They often argue over who's going to hold the phone to speak to us. And it's lovely and it really builds me up every day and it's lovely to talk to them, to see them. But sometimes I just don't get chance to speak because it's already a crowded environment and it can't really accommodate another voice because there's all much already so much going on. And that just made me think about, I would hate God to feel that about me. I would hate God to think, well, I just can't, my voice is never heard. I try to speak, but there's so much going on. There's so many other voices. I don't get a chance to speak into the innermost being of my heart. Thank you, Marie, for, for those thoughts. These last few weeks, we've been looking at the way of peace. Uh, th this idea that there is a way of peace, there is a practice, there is a habit, there is a, a pathway that we can walk down, a way of living that cultivates and grows and enables peace to be active in our hearts. And what I've, I've come to, to realise is the last couple of weeks that there's been an unease in me. Um, and I, I don't know what really where that's come from, whether that's just the situation and it, and it taking its toll over time, um, whether it's uh, just the difficulty of the weather this week. I don't know how, if you felt it, that being stuck in more and, and not being able to get out as easily and, and trying to keep the kids entertained in the home is it, far more difficult than just setting them free out in the garden. Uh, but but there, there's been this practice of peace that's been going on and yet also this this lack of peace. And I, I'm not sure, maybe you felt that, maybe you haven't been doing the practice and so that explains it, or maybe you have, and yet there's still something that doesn't quite fit up. And I come to this week and, and I realised I've run out of reasons, I've run out of verses, I've run out of explanations, I've run out of steps and habits and, and practices to do, and yet peace is still seems to be, in some sense, out there. There is a peace, but there seems like it's lacking in some sense. And, and I, I feel bad about sharing that because... I could give myself and I could give you reasons why we should be hopeful, why we should be joyful and content, reasons why it's not really that bad, uh, reasons why we shouldn't complain, reasons why we should be grateful, reasons why other people are worse off and, and if I compare myself to them actually we're not doing too badly, uh, reasons why there is a bigger picture uh, at work that we can engage with and, and make part of our framework, uh, reasons to keep on persevering, to get through this, to stay strong. I, can, I know all those reasons. Uh, and yet when I hear them, it kind of just makes me feel worse because it's just the way I feel. So it's just what's going on and, and nothing seems to be changing that. And, and I'm looking for reasons and I'm looking for explanations to make sense of it. And perhaps you are too. I know I've had a few calls this week, not from people in the church, actually from people, I don't know if they were Christians or just people outside the church. One called up and said, is this the end of the world? They're looking for a reason. And so I said to them, let me just go check my diary and I'll let you know um, uh, that we did have another conversation after that. But the, the, what's the reason? What's going on? What, why is this happening? That's the question we're asking. People will see reasons. I'm learning to slow down. I'm learning to appreciate. There is things coming out of this. There is a, a reason behind it. I can see the lessons that I'm learning. And yet I have a feeling that at one point those reasons are going to run out or they're going to become stale, or they're going to become old, or they're going to become dry, and they're not going to have the power that they have at the moment to keep us going. And I wonder if that's always meant to be the case. Let me read you the passage that I want to look at today. It's in Romans chapter 5, where Paul was talking uh, to the Christian church, and he says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, the middle bit of that passage is, I think, where a lot of us are. That through this suffering, we know that it's producing perseverance and character and hope. And, and those are the things, those are the reasons. They're the things that we're looking for. They're the things that get us through. If there's a reason for this, then it's OK. If I can understand what's happening, then I'll be all right. But you, what we miss is that on either side of those reasons is almost the same idea. He starts off saying we've been justified through faith and we have peace with God. And that peace means we have gained access into his grace in which we stand, that, that we have access to God himself. And then he ends it saying this hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured out, not because of the reasons we're not carrying on because of the reasons although there are reasons but because that his love has been poured out there's been an experience of the love of God by the Holy Spirit which has been given to us and he couches it all in these two ideas and what what it, it highlights is this thing that we we we've fallen into as Christians that our belief is based on what and that we ask the question what do you believe in really what do, what do you believe in what, what do I believe? And here's what I believe. Wow, you believe that? Well, that, that? That doesn't fit with what I believe. You couldn't join my church with that belief. I believe that God exists. I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I believe that he died on the cross. I believe it, it, our, our sinner's prayer, the thing when people come to faith, we say, pray this. I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I believe that he died in my place. I believe that he di- rose again. And I believe that his grace is, I believe that, that, what, what, and this idea of believing that we've we've taken hold of is based on what and that and, and those sort of ideas. But in the Bible and in this passage, believing doesn't focus on what someone believes in. It's not centred on, on what or that. It's centred in who. Believing is a who word, not a what word. It's not I believe that God is this and what God will do. It's I believe in him, full stop. The, the better word to substitute whenever you read belief is trust. Jesus talked about this. He said, you search the scriptures thinking that in them is life, all the what's and the that's, but you don't come to me and I'm the one they point to. And what I realised is all the advice that I've given, and I hope it's been helpful, and all the insights that we've been able to share and the answers we can give and the reasons, they aren't enough. I give you 10 reasons to have hope and 10 reasons to be at peace and I can tell you he is with you and he is for you and he loves you and he is good and I've got all those reasons but then why is it that peace seems to escape us? It it seems to get me through a day but it doesn't change anything permanently and what I I, I found is that reasons are, are good but revelation is better. Marie talked about these moments where where different people throughout the Bible took themselves off and they found silence and solitude, then they found time to connect with God. And then I looked at some of those Pentecost, that there's this, depending how you, you measure Pentecost, some say it's 40 days, some say it's 50, but there's this period where they're waiting and they're in isolation and they're seeking and it ends with this encounter, this experience of God. You've got the, the wilderness in the Old Testament where they're led out of slavery and for 40 years they're, they're wandering, at it, but they're guided by the presence of God who's with them. You've got Jesus and his temptation and, and that is couched by, at the start, the Spirit of God speaking, saying, you're my son who I love, this experience. And then the, there's this temptation, this trial that he goes through where he's emptied of himself and, and has to rely on the strength of God that's been given to him. And then he goes out with the presence of God and the power of God in his life. They're all 40 days, interestingly, but they, they all they all centre on this coming away and discovering not a reason, not an explanation, not 10 steps, 6 steps, 4 steps, 3 steps, but just God. Access to him and an outpouring of his love by the Holy Spirit that, that gets them through. And if they have no explanation of what's going on, they say that's enough. And that's what Paul's saying here. Through all all these trials and sufferings, an outpouring of the love of God and experience of that by the Holy Spirit gets you through. 
Hope does not put us to shame, not because it would all work out in the end, not because God has a plan, not because he is good, although all those things are true, but because of this revelation, this revealing from God to us of his love. Not this or that, but because love has been poured out. And without any explanation or reason, the love of God can keep you. And that's, you might say, well, that's not helpful, Dean. I know that God loves me, but there we go again. I know that he loves me. There's a difference in hearing that, okay, I, I get that God loves me. I hear that, I read that God loves me. There's a difference in, in that as a reason and that as a revelation. God himself communicating to you, God himself showing you, revealing to you his love and you experiencing that for yourself. The question I, I have to ask today and I have asked it myself the last few weeks is when was the last time you received that from him? See, I, I ask God for things, but I ask them in a way that say, God, please show me, please guide me, please lead me. But it's only so I can say, oh, all right, I get it now. I see it. I understand. Thank you. I, I, I know what's going on. But this is saying it's not so much what God would say to you, but it's that he would say it to you. You don't need a reason as much as you need a revelation. You don't need provision as much as you need to know the provider. You don't need a pleasant experience as much as you need an encounter with your father, with your saviour, with his spirit. Jesus in his temptation, in his emptying time, says man does not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the word there isn't every word that has proceeded in the past, something that happened, something you can look back to and say, wasn't that a great time? Wasn't that a great thing? But that proceeds daily, continually. The word that comes to you today, the experience, the encounter, the revelation that comes to you, the outpouring that comes to you today. What that means is that you can starve by reading the Bible because it's a dead word unless God is speaking it today. We're not talking about quiet time and Bible study. Those are helpful in another category. We're talking about bringing all that you are to encounter God and allow him to pour into your heart the truth that you may be read a thousand times, but until he breathes life into it, it means nothing. It means you can starve, but live in your life serving and doing things for God because you aren't listening today. Now, just as a quick aside, when I talk about an experience, I'm not saying we pursue the experience for the sake of the experience. That, that's, not, that's not what it's about. I've been down that road and it leads to frustration and, and, and emptiness. It's not the experience we're after. It's God himself we're after. But that is evidenced, as Paul says, by an outpouring of the Spirit and his love for us. That when you meet with God, it's got to do something. Something's got to be different. No one ever meets Jesus and goes, well, that was nice. Something changes when we meet him. So we're not going after the experience. We're going after him and wherever that leads us, open-handed, whatever that might show us, open-handed, whatever he has to say to us, whatever we have to receive from him, just to be with him and to, to receive it. Because as I said, it's not what he says. It's just that it's him that says it. That's what makes the difference. How long is it since you had a sense of God's love being poured out into your heart maybe you say I'm not even sure what that's like I'm not even sure I've ever had that I didn't even know really it was a thing maybe you think it's for those those extra charismatic over the top people who, who like that sort of thing I just want to read you a passage uh, from a book by a guy called John Flavel uh, he, he was a Puritan they were a group of Christians hundreds, a few hundred years ago um, they don't sound like the most fun type of group, um, Puritans, it sounds a bit holier than thou, but when you read what they say, they are people who are in love with God and thought about what it meant to know God's love and live in it. And here's what he says. He says, ecstasy and delight are essential to the believer's soul and they promote sanctification. So they, they grow us in Christ's likeness. These are good things. He says, we were not meant to live without spiritual exhilaration. And the Christian who goes for a long time without the experience of heartwarming will soon find themselves tempted to have their emotions satisfied from earthly things and not from the Spirit of God. The soul is so formed that it craves fulfilment from things outside itself, and it will embrace earthly joys for satisfaction when it cannot reach spiritual ones. A believer is in spiritual danger if they allow themselves to go for any length of time without tasting the love of Christ and savouring the felt comforts of a Saviour's presence. When Christ ceases to fill the heart with satisfaction, our souls will go in silent search of other lovers. By the enjoyment of the love of Christ in the heart of a believer, 
We mean an experience of the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. Because the Lord has made himself accessible to us, it is our privilege to seek this experience from him till we are made joyful partakers of it. He's talking there about what Paul says, that there is this access to God. There is this encounter, this this filling of the spirit, this outpouring of his love and that we're in danger, that there is something in our hearts. I love how he puts it. We, we silently search for other things. When we don't have this, when we've missed this, when we've walked away from it, it's not like we say, right, I'm done with God. I'm going to find something else. But our hearts just silently begin to wander, silently go after something else. But there is an encounter that makes us alive that we are to seek for, that renews us, that gives us something that nothing else can. All the reasons and explanations will never do it. And it's at that point where I realise my own limits. God's love has been poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit and that that's all I can give you and an encouragement to seek that and then for you to do it. Because you can come away from this and, and if you say that was a nice message or a challenging message or a thought-provoking message, then, then I failed. If you go away with anything other than a concrete hunger, a concrete desire, decision to, to seek this, this outpouring of the love of God for you and to pursue and to, and to get access to God and make use of that access to God, then it's fallen short. And that's maybe why you won't do it. So much easier when things come second hand, when we can rely on other people's experience and other people's insights and other people's wisdom. But I can't give this to you. No pastor can give it to you. No preacher. You can go listen to the best preachers in the world and you can at the moment. But no one of them can give this to you. This has to come direct from God. And it means you bringing your heart to him, all that you are, into his presence. And sometimes that will be all the, the goodness and, and the awareness that you have to him. And sometimes it will be bringing all the mess and the darkness. I've been reading this week Psalm 88 and 89. If you're in a bad mood, don't go there because they are the most depressing psalms. They just accuse God and they, they, they um, are upset and they're angry and they're raw. And one of them starts off wonderful. Psalm 89 is like, God, you're amazing and your promises last forever. And then it turns and goes, so why have you failed us? Why have you let us down? Why are you missing? Why are you hiding? And, and and they kind of make you go, whoa, are you allowed to say that? But they're in our Bible and they're there because what they're doing is taking all that they are, but they're bringing it to God. They're not taking it all and just bottling it up and burying it under excuses. That They're taking it and they're bringing it into access to God so that he can see it and he can speak to it and he can respond to it and pour out himself into it because they are emptied. But there they find that God can fill them. In Isaiah, someone sent me this passage this week, which again just tied into what I was thinking. It says this, God speaking, he says, Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, come and take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come and listen to me with your ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Whatever you need. If you need milk today because you're at that stage and you've never experienced this and you're brand new to it. If you need milk, milk is there. And don't be afraid. Just come and the milk that you need, the, the first steps, the tiny little things that you need to get you going are there. Need something stronger? You need wine? That's there too. Don't be afraid. Come. There is more for you. There is more. Come. Call on him. Listen and you'll find life. Seek him while you can. This is the invitation. It's the invitation Jesus gave us. Abide with me. Tarry with me is the old fashioned word. Wait with me. Be still with me. Be still and know that I am God. Do not lose your first love. My sheep, hear my voice. Listen. Ask. And when you've asked and you haven't got what you need, then seek. And after you've been seeking and looking for it, knock. Don't give up. Don't relent. Keep going. The vision that I have is each one of us receiving something from God. The whole situation that we're all going through together and yet God speaking different things to each one of us as we have need. An experience of his love for each one of us. For every individual. We've been empty. That's what these, these, this time has been about. Everything external has been taken and what we're left with, what's inside. And for... For many of us, we look and we go, there wasn't much there. There were lots of reasons, lots of practices, lots of habits, but 
but nothing of me connecting with God. Jesus goes through this too. 40 days he is emptied. 40 days everything is taken away and yet he's able to stand firm through it because of this encounter where God speaks and says, this is my son who I love. And he comes out stronger. You may have noticed that a lot of these encounters, they centre around this 40 days. 40 days uh, isolation, 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days of seeking, 40 days until Pentecost. And so on Thursday, as I was thinking about this, I just thought, how long have we been in isolation? How long have we been in lockdown now? And as of last night, from the Monday morning on the 23rd when it happened to Saturday evening last night, it's been, you guessed it, 40 days. And so as I look back over those 40 days, I can see that I've read more and I've I've reprioritized things and I've done more in some areas and I've done less in other areas. And my question that I have is in those 40 days, have I taken that chance to meet him? Have I heard God in those 40 days? Do I have an experience of the love of God shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us? And have you? And if not, then I would just encourage you and perhaps we'll explore this in the next few weeks to take a first step to stepping into the access that we have and receiving for you what you need more than all the reasons. They're all good and they're all helpful and all the practices are great, but you've been given more. If there's any sense of guilt in you, any, oh, I know what I should have done, I know I should do this, I know that I know that's what Christians should do, then push past that wagging finger that says, oh, you terrible Christian, and just hear in this the gentle invite of your saviour, of Jesus himself saying, come and ask of me. Just come and ask of me. Come come and seek me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not playing hide and seek. I'm not, I'm not far away. Just come and seek me. Come, come and start knocking. Start get, being active about this. Come, come and discover. Come, come and take this seriously. Come and be with me. Come and abide. Stop with me. And there, there I end because I can do no more. But encourage you to do that and then trust for God to meet with you as he's promised to do. As he does time and time again in, in loud ways and in complete silent ways. In incredible ways but each one enough to get us through. Not just each day but to, to give us the strength that we need. To give us the only thing we've ever needed. Him and his love poured out to us. So, Father, I pray now, because I'm at the end of myself, I'm at the end of my reasons, my excuses, my explanations, and that's not a bad thing. And all that is left is for us to bring who we are to you. When all is stripped away as it has been, when we are emptied as we have have been, there's something in us that will still go after things, still seek to fill our minds and times with other things unless our heart is satisfied by your love. And so I just pray now in faith in Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, pour out your love. Reveal your love to each one of us. Guide us into your presence. Give us the commitment to be still to know you. And may we be satisfied with nothing less than an encounter, the outpouring of the love of God by the Holy Spirit to our hearts, to hear it not secondhand, not in old experiences, but something new and fresh and directly from you, Father. Lord, we don't chase this for experience sake. We're not in this for experience sake. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.